today is kind of going to be a shift from the more type of um, artificial intelligence type of algorithms, machine learning that we were doing until now, to the more statistically oriented one. Okay? So they're going to be, it's like going back in a sense to linear regression to some degree, although we're using it in a predictive way. Okay? There's going to be some modeling, some assumptions going on. <clears throat> and it also means <clears throat> that with all that baggage that we're going to be carrying now, there's going to be a big benefit. Any idea? When you start moving to more model-driven methods, what do you gain? Okay, so they're going to be better for explaining, definitely. They'll give you more insight. They're not a black box, right? You plug in and get good predictions. Definitely, that's one thing. What's another thing? Even if you're trying to predict, insight is important too, even when you're trying to predict. What else do you gain by having a structure, right? A model that says, here is a linear relationship between something. Anybody have an idea what you gain by going model-driven rather than driven? When you're going data-driven, what did we need? What did all those algorithms really want? What did they require? Lots and lots of data, right? Because they're learning everything from the data. What we're doing now is we're imposing some structure and saying, this is kind of what it's going to look like. Let's just use the estimate parameters. And that's much cheaper than capturing the whole pattern from the data, right? Think again about, um, I don't know, um, what we did in, in time series, right? We had exponential smoothing that was trying to capture the whole thing, whereas regression said, well, here are the dummies. You're going to have 12 seasons, and you're going to have a season that goes up and down like this and a trend that goes like that, right? So we're going to need less data. And these methods are actually much older in terms of time, right, chronology, than the ones that we've seen in the last few weeks because they came out of this notion of we don't have a lot of data and we're trying to find a signal in them. So the statistical methods are coming from a world of scarce data, scarce data, and we're trying to capture as much as we can. Okay? But what's beautiful about the, the ones that I'll show you is that they scale up very nicely. So if you have a lot of data, beautifully. And I remember um, once Daryl Pregibon from Google gave a talk, and of course we couldn't record anything or you know, nothing. Um, but he mentioned one interesting thing. He's a statistician. He was um, the head of the data mining group at AT&T, and he moved to Google. And he said the biggest surprise to him was to see the computer scientists at Google take logistic regression and scale it up and use it on millions of records. He never thought it would work. And they definitely it there. I mean, it's a great technique. And it, it might actually be the winner in a lot of your projects. It might be, you know, the top one or the top two. It's a great method. It works just amazingly. It's very old, and it's basically the cousin of linear regression. Okay? So with that, I kind of start with this really nasty name, logistic regression. So remember I told you there's a, a, a rule of thumb. How do you know if a method is coming from statistics or not? If the terminology is kind of not cool and very thinking. Yeah? All right. So we're going to logistic regression. And um, that's why this uh, right, scramble word, superpower, psychologic, pseudocious. And we're moving now into the cousin of logistic regression. Now, before I introduce a cousin, I need to explain to you why we can't just use linear regression, right? Because we saw linear regression is very, very versatile. We can use it for lots of things. So why can't we back it just a little more and use it in a case where the Y is a categor categorical rather than numerical, right? That's the whole story. So I'm going to start to kind of show you why, why it doesn't work and why we need to do a little more than just adapt linear regression. But you'll see at the end of the day that it's going to look pretty similar. And the outputs are going to look pretty similar. The thing that's going to be different is we're not going to be talking about predicting the Y, but instead we're talking about predicting something called the odds. Okay? So this, we're moving into betting now. Okay? We're going to be predicting or explaining the odds of an event, whether it happened or not, right? If you think about a yes, no, Y. And then I'll talk about prediction, how we use it for prediction. And as Newton suggested before, this is going to actually be much more transparent and going to be very useful for explanation. So when people are doing explanation, logistic regression is going to be really at the top of their list because it's the most explanatory. Like regression, it will give you a set of coefficients, and you can see their sizes and interpret them, and key values really look very similar. Okay? So that's where we're going with logistic regression. Okay. <clears throat> Remember this little example with the uh, online bartender that... Um, wants to uh, see the right beer, the light beer, or the regular beer based on you walk in and they estimate your age and your gender and all that stuff. All right, so let's kind of keep that in mind. 
And I'm going to use that little example again just to highlight the difference from the other methods that we've seen thus far. Okay, but of course we'll also look at a bigger example. And here's that same data set. This is the same slide from last time. Nothing new. Okay? And let's say now, instead of doing a predictive, I might want to do a profiling. Okay? So the only difference from last time is this time I'm saying, well, I don't really want to do this online bartender. Instead, what I'm trying to do as a beer manufacturer is I'm trying to understand what are the demographics of people who prefer the light beer versus the regular beer. Why would I care? Anybody have an idea? Why, why would I care? Why would the beer manufacturer want to know? What do you think? Okay, excellent. So advertising, right. If you know that a certain neighborhood or a certain area of the city has these demographics and these people prefer regular beer, you might advertise differently, right, or have different channels depending on age and how people are. So definitely that would be a really good example why you'd want to profile. Okay? So same data. Morning. Totally different um, task. And I'm saying totally. I mean, it looks like just a word. I hope you've gotten the feeling now why this is going to be totally different than trying to do the online bartender. Okay? Prediction and explanation are really going to take us in different, different ways. Ah, let me actually put a side note there. If anybody really wants to see even more about differences between prediction and explanation, I give it a talk at 11.30 at the neighboring building, uh, EDMS, evaluation, uh, what's the, I don't remember their building. Uh, I can tell you later. Um, it's called to explain or to predict. If you're interested, um, I'll give you the details in a sec, later. Okay, so we're doing an explanatory task. We still have the same four um, input variables, gender, marital, status, and age, and we're trying to, to explain, right, whether people like light beer or regular beer. So we're trying to profile the people according to their demographics. Okay, so now let's see why can't we just do a linear regression, right? I'll take this set of data and turn this into a dummy into zero, one, okay? And then I'll give it to, I don't know, Excel Miner or choose your favorite regression tool and run it. Is it going to run? Will it run? Well, I get an output. Yeah, right? I mean, the software doesn't know if zero, one, it, it's just numbers, right? It's, okay, you will get an output. That's the bad news, right? Because if it would have said, no, we can't run this, you'd know, oh, I can't do any regression. So the bad news is you will get an output, and it will look just fine. It will look perfect, right? I'm just going to go and run this model, fit it, and here's the output. And you'll get, everything will look fine, the coefficient table, and it will just look normal. But you have to start thinking just a little more. If you're just running menus, you won't know it. You'll do silly, silly things. And this is where you come in and say, oh, these guys are doing silly things. We should teach them what to do, right? We should send them to a course on data mining or whatever. Now you have to just either think about this logic or start digging in a little more into the output and start to draw stuff. All right. So first of all, let's think about this model, okay? Right there. When I run this, what kind of residuals can I get? Or what kind of predictions? Let's just go easier. What kind of predictions can this model give you? What kind of numbers can I get? Okay, does it have to be between zero and one? If I plug in numbers there, do I have to get in numbers between zero and one? It could be negative. Can it be above one? Yeah, it can be anything. Okay, so you're producing predictions that are totally meaningless. That's the first alarm, right? You generate predictions, and they're all over the place, whereas your inputs are either regular beer or light beer, so it has to be a zero one like that dummy that you coded. So that's one thing you might have either thought about or dug in and generated predictions and looked at them. Okay, so that's not good. If you start doing residual analysis, for instance, you'll draw residual. They're, they're going to look very weird. Do these look like any of the clouds that we were looking at? Because of that zero or one, everything looks very, very different. So again, either you think about this rationally and you said, I fit a model like this, but actually I can get any number once I plug in those coefficients. Because gender is okay, maybe just zero and one, that's easy. But income can have any value, right? And if it's not one of the numbers that I had in my set, it's not one of the people in my set that has this profile, you'll just get an arbitrary, arbitrary, but meaningless number to you. Okay? Okay. So again, the bad news, you will get an output. The good news, if you think about it, or once you've been here, <clears throat> you'll remember that you can't just use linear regression on categorical data, like just turning the Y into numerical dummies. Okay? 
All right, so hopefully, and again, there's, there's a little more about this in the book if you want. What we're going to do now is try and do something a little crazy. Well, not really crazy, right? If you have a problem to solve and you have your methodology, usually what you try and do is take the problem, translate it into the world that you know how to solve, and then solve it there. So what we're going to try to do now is I'm going to take that categorical Y that I don't really know how to deal with with a linear regression, and I'm going to try and turn it into a continuous Y and then kind of do a linear regression. Okay? So I want to take a transformation, if you want, of the categorical Y so that it turns into something numerical that can go anywhere between negative infinity and infinity, right? So the linear regression can produce anything. And then just do a linear regression, basically. That's the big idea. To do this, that transformation is a little tricky. It's not taking a square or doing a log. It's just a little more tricky because we're kind of conceptually moving from a binary, right? It's a whole numerical. And to do this, what we do is we start looking at something a little bit different. Well, the first thing you might think of <clears throat> is why not just talk about the probability of preferring light year. Okay, let's say light year is one. Okay. So instead of saying y equals one or zero, we'll model on the left-hand side the probability of y being one. Right? That's something between zero and one, but it gets numerical values, so it can be anything between zero and one. Right? So I would put the p on the left-hand side of that equation. And the question is this: good enough? <clears throat> if I do this, <clears throat> and, and you know, you're going to ask me, well, how are you going to compute this probability? Forget about that for a minute. Let's just assume I can obtain this number for every person. Okay? Let's assume. Is this good enough? Is there a regression on there? What do you think? I mean, it will run. We all know it will run. But is it? Useful or not useful? We saw if we just ran it on the original Y, it's, it's, again, useless. How about here? What do you think? Okay, so you're saying, yes, this is also a little bit limited because probabilities, although they can take not only numbers 0 and 1 between, they can't take any numbers outside. And this regression can produce, again, negative numbers, right? Numbers above 1. So this is not good enough. It's better, but it's not good enough. Okay? So let's do something more to this. I'm going to torture the two more steps of death. Next step, we're going to do the following. Instead of looking at the probability, I'm going to look at something called the odds of an event. Okay? This was the probability of the event, a preferring light here. Now I'm going to look at something called the odds of the event. And this is that little W or omega or whatever you want it to be. And it's just, I mean, mathematically it's defined as the probability over 1 minus the probability. If anyone here has done any, you know, betting on, on horses or cars or whatever, then odds, you know, when you say three to one or four to one, that's what it is. And the weirdest thing about this thing called odds, the oddest thing about odds, is that the term odds does not exist in any language besides English. I tried this with every possible language. I've asked every person that I know that has a different language. There's a word for chance, there's a word for probability, there is no word for odds. So it really is not an intuitive thing unless, you know, you've been betting. All right. So, again, when you say the odds are two to one, it means that the odds of this thing are twice, right? It's the probability is twice as the other one. But it's something that you have to, sometimes you want to move back to probability if that feels more comfortable. Now, the reason we're going to talk about odds is because you're going to see that they're going to play the major role when we interpret the output of the regression. So remember when we were doing linear regression, we were saying a unit increase in x1 is five unit increases in y, or percentage increase in x. Here we're going to say a unit increase in x affects the odds in a certain way. Okay, so all the interpretation is going to be in terms of odds, and that's why we care about what they mean. And then if you look at the odds, if I plug in the extremes, right, probabilities go between 0 and 1. So where do the odds go? What are, where, what's the range of odds? What kind of values can odds take? Zero to infinity, right? And if you look at this little graph, here is the probability on the x-axis, the top graph here. And that p goes between 0 and 1. And you can see the odds as a function of p. So it does go between 0 and infinity when p goes between 0 and 1. So we got rid of that upper threshold, right? We can go all the way up to infinity, but odds cannot take numbers. So we still can't plug in the odds on the left-hand side. 
So here's the last piece of torture. If we have a variable that only takes non-negative numbers and we want to transform it into the whole range, we did that forever. We take a log. So we're going to work in log odds. And log odds are also called the logit. Okay, so at the end of the day, this crazy transformation of the original binary variable, the Y that says light beer or regular beer, I'm going to look at the log of the odds of preferring light beer on the left-hand side. And everything on the right-hand side will look just like regression, linear regression. And then conceptually, we run a linear regression on that. And I'm saying conceptually because there's one little detail there I'll mention in a minute, okay? But all I want you to remember is conceptually, you're working in the log of the odds on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it's just all the predictors, the way we used to do it, and you can put in interaction terms, and you can put in all the quadratic, all the stuff that we did in linear regression. Same thing. And then you kind of run a linear regression to estimate those betas. That's the whole story. How we do that, we're going to use it for explanation by saying, what does it mean to increase a unit increase, right, in 1x, and how does it affect the log odds, or how does it affect the probability at the end of the day? And when we do predictions, we're going to plug in the x's, just like we did in linear regression, and it will throw out a, lo a logit, right? It will give us a logit, and then we will translate that back in order to generate a classification. So that's the big story.